model using RADSEC. Um, ben can take it away as soon as you hear the, the noise. Okay. Okay, sounds good. Thanks everyone for coming. There we are. Uh, hello, it's, uh, she said, I am Ben Clifford. I'm a PhD candidate from the University of Notre Dame. And I work in uh, Mike Frender's laboratory. And to him, I'm very grateful for the opportunity to pursue this research, uh, as well as my co-authors, Jackie Lopez and Mikhail Fonte. Um, so basically today, I wanted to begin with uh, a little bit of perspective. I'm sure we're all aware that we're entering something of a genomic era, whereby sequence data and published genomes are increasingly easy to come by. Um, and this is really the motivation behind my research, projects such as the I5K. This is an initiative looking to sequence 5,000 arthropod genomes uh, within the next five years, virtually all of them of non-model species. And so with all these new genomes coming, what really motivates my research and the perspectives that I take and will share in this talk are how smaller projects can really go to complement these large initiatives. Um, and my main contention here is that beginning with the focus of ecotypes within these new genomes are a great way um, to begin interpreting new genomic data uh, for fundamentally three reasons. Primarily, they are linked inextricably to evolutionary mechanisms that are separating um, populations under real-world differential ecological regimes. Um, if there are admixed taxa between uh, ecotype species, uh, measuring interaggression and admixture between the two can tell you about um, de the degree and the demography of isolation between the parent ecotypes. Uh, and also, if you take a population level view, um, it enables you to map and measure divergence. Um, and that's what I'm going to be doing today. So, um, the species that I'm working with is Daphne Apulex, which had its genome uh, published and released in 2011 science publication, uh, which is right around the time that I began embarking on this research. Uh, a little bit more about my organism, Daphne apulex is sometimes called the water flea. It's a zooplankton uh, filter feeding microcrustacean that occupies a variety of freshwater habitats. Uh, from a vernal pond, this is a woodland snowmelt type pond, which may even only be a half a meter deep, maybe. Uh, filled with water for only a month out of the year. These are filled with zooplankton, which are, in many cases, sister taxon to what you might find in more typical larger freshwater lakes. Uh, the Daphne apulicaria, the lake-dwelling ecotype of this species, uh, is, um, has been studied in food, food web ecology and has been a staple in food web studies going back about a century. And when I refer to an emerging ecogenomic model, that's really what this type of research is trying to get after, is taking uh, long ecology model organisms and coupling them to new genomic in inquiries. Uh, the other fantastic feature of Daphne apulex is their uh, legendary phenotypic plasticity. Uh, this is sort of a wild type pulex phenotype uh, induced with what are called neck teeth here uh, upon exposure to predatory chiromone hormone. So this is sort of a polyphenic response to uh, fish predation. And uh, in some cases, some, some strains that will also de develop these very exaggerated helmet-type phenotypes, all in the name of being harder for uh, gape-limited fish predators to swallow. Um, so this is a very, uh, this is a taxa that's very capable of phenotypic plasticity. Uh, and the two that I study, this North American pulex, that, which dwells in these vernal ponds, and the pulicaria of lakes, uh, are this so characteristically subdivided group. Um, we know based on CO1 markers, so this is mitochondrial cytochrome oxidase 1, uh, that they're somewhat narrowly divergent within this larger clade here of things, which is sometimes called the Daphne pulex species complex. I choose to work with these two because they co-occur geographically um, and they are characterized by this very distinct pond-lake type radiation. Um, given the plasticity of these things, there's sort of two competing hypotheses. Either this is a larger, somewhat more panamictic thing, which is subdividing very locally into ponds and lakes. Otherwise, there are incipient speciation mechanisms under that are going on that we can begin to characterize. Um, most of the uh, cl genetics classically uh, informing this system are those from allozyme data, 
And in fact, operationally, these subecotypes are distinguished on the basis of uh, LDH lactate dehydrogenase uh, alizyme genotyping. That is, most, uh, most vernal pond caught Daphne apulex tend to be fixed for the slow, slow, uh, electrophoretically migrating alizyme allele, whereas the late ones tend to be fixed for fast, fast. But, but we know that certain vernal ponds tend to be populated with these mysterious FS heterozygous populations. So we know that operationally there is some assortment based on certain alizyme genotyping. But where I come in is really trying to take a whole genome perspective on how subdivided these things actually are. Um, and my approach in doing so is to take a restriction site associated DNA sequencing approach. Uh, this is sometimes called RAD seq or RAD tagging. And I won't get into my methods too much. If you have questions, feel free to ask me later. But basically, what you're doing is exposing whole genome DNA to restriction enzymes, which make the same homologous uh, cuts and then sequencing around those cuts. And somewhat more heuristically, if a beautiful whole genome assembly is this gorgeous picture of a mountainscape on the left, what I'm essentially doing is taking many, many grainy photos, cramming them all on my memory card, and comparing the differences at a somewhat lower scale of resolution. Um, and so again, this is a very uh, cost and time and space efficient way to get at these questions. And here are some results. So uh, my first pass analysis of this was to plot these things out in PCA space, uh, colorized here by LDH genotyping. So the fast, fast lake uh, samples here as the blue triangles, uh, the pond slow, slow uh, as brown squares, and then those that we knew to be heterozygous at this allozyme locus as the pink dots here. Uh, and really what this uh, is showing is that LDH is reasonably successful in clustering these into three main groups. Although the middle group is also occupied by things which were shown to be fixed for either the single locus perspective. So again, this is a distillation of many rad associated SNPs, nearly 3,000 that passed my quality filters in this case. Uh, so this was somewhat intriguing and uh, sort of confirmatory of LDH as a diagnostic allele. I wanted to carry this a step further and began to um, parse out what's happening with the parent ecotype taxa in this system. So I took 40 known pulicaria and pulex and plotted just those, just the extremes out in PCA space. Uh, and as you can see, they clustered into two very, very distinct uh, clusters. And something that's very noteworthy about the way that these two clustered is the predominance of PC1. So these are the first eight eigenvalues plotted out. Uh, the first explains uh, nearly 46% of genetic variants here. And I was curious how that would correspond to more traditional population genetic type measures. So the, the 3,400 or so SNPs that went into informing this PCA, I uh, also took FST values, plotted those against the loading of the first principal component, really segregating these things out from the left and right and plotted those together. It turns out that the loading value on this first principal component access per SNP uh, has a strikingly linear predictive relationship with the FST of that SNP between the two groups that I'm showing. Uh, this is an R squared of 0.986, uh, which is what you would expect to see in a, in a true speciation type scenario being uh, the main driver of this divergence and the way that these two clusters sit with respect to one another. Um, so that's sort of the whole genome perspective, irregardless of where my variants sit. I wanted to take that a step further, um, and uh, the existence of this uh, microsatellite linkage map um, really enabled me to do that. So Daphne Apulex, 12 linkage groups, this is a microsatellite-based map. And what I've colorized in red here are scaffolds that I had of the Apulex genome. Uh, that I was able to blast these primer sets onto that originally comprised this linkage map so that I could orient scaffolds, certain scaffolds in uh, a respective linear order along each of the linkage groups in recombination space. And in so doing, I was able to take those FST values and put together an FST scan across the 12 linkage groups of Daphne Apulex. So again, this is with the 40 and 40 samples that I showed earlier. 
um, FST, so uh, um, divergence from zero to one on the y-axis of each of these. And what I'm showing here is about 40%, only about 40% of the physical genome in total, but in the linear relationships as they reasonably sit on the linkage groups that make up this genome. Uh, and the red bands and the blue bands I have here are uh, significantly elevated and depressed 100 kb windows of genomic divergence uh, as determined by randomization testing. Um, so this is um, a, a somewhat thinner representation than the entire genome, but there are still a few features that stand out, namely a, a seemingly re uh, depressed region of genomic divergence on linkage group two, and uh, still some bands of elevated and depressed FST uh, that are popping forth. Uh, by the way, LDH, the diagnostic allele that uh, I made reference to earlier, that did blast against the uh, Daphnia pulex genome to a scaffold, which in the scaffold to linkage group um, uh, transition turned out to be right in the middle of this uh, significantly elevated FST band, which was very consistent with what we predicted. Um, and the last figure I'll show, this was put together using a program called Fine Structure. So this is very similar to a structure plot, although it is broken down by linkage groups. So you can actually colorize what putative haplotypes uh, derive from which parent groups over the course of the genome. So where I have dark brown, those are two Pulex haplotype uh, uh, regions in a row, each individual here is a row, um, in the Pulex group and the Pulicaria group. And then I've also got the, the intermediate sort of meso hybrid group as well. The pink regions are areas where there was one Pulicaria and one Pulex sort of F1, uh, both haplotypes residing there. Um, so these approaches also enable you to infer haplotypes and uh, map them accordingly structure type approaches. Um, so to wrap this up in three easy pieces, uh, first we found that we have strong evidence for genetic subdivision extensively between the pond-dwelling ecotype Daphnia pulex and the lake-dwelling Daphnia pulicaria. Uh, we see that the putative hybrids that we uh, found um, presumed to exist uh, are somewhat intermediate in fact between the two parent ecotype species. Uh, and then thirdly, a sort of a methodological take on this approach of combining reference genomes, RADseq, and linkage map uh, data sets uh, were in fact able to readily map and measure genomic divergence. Uh, thank you all for your time, and uh, I'd be happy to field any questions.